This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, uh, thanks for, uh, for 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 having me um, to to give this talk about uh, my journey into numismatics um, and uh, the the Black Money exhibit and some of the things that we're trying to do with uh, with that project. Um, I think the last time um, I I visited the um, the ANS, I, I can't even remember. I I'm a New York, I still count myself as a New Yorker, even though I haven't um, lived there in, in, in quite some time, but, you know, still have family in the Bronx and, uh, you know, New York is still one of, one of, one of the places that, I, that I'm proud to call uh, home. What I would like to uh, achieve today is to uh, have a conversation about my journey into numismatics uh, as as uh, as as a hobby, but also as a as a as a profession, as I I research um, how we can use money as a historical source, and that's what I do in my day job as a as a professor uh, at uh, Georgia State University. Um, but I also want to use this opportunity to talk about uh, how I'm using, or my team is using, the Black Money Exhibit. Um, to bring in um, non-traditional uh, collectors, if you will, into the hobby, into the field, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, I will talk about that image um, uh, in a, once I get through the slide, the, uh, the image on the front cover. Uh, but again, I wanna thank you for this opportunity for having me present. So I think, let me start just by going, um, I'm gonna sort of go through a couple of these images on the screen. Um, and I wanna go back to my childhood in Jamaica where I was born. Um, I think I was probably about nine years old uh, or so, and I was playing underneath uh, someone's, uh, my neighbor's house, uh, my, my best friend's uh, house. Um, you know, they have like a, a cellar, they call it a cellar. And I was playing um, under the cellar and I found this wallet. And this wallet had uh, some banknotes um, in it that I had uh, never seen before. Uh, and actually I'm going to do a bit of show and tell today. Um, these are some of the uh, banknotes um, that, um, you know, I, I found in that wallet. And, and this is a, um, this is a sort of a packet that I, I, I got from the uh, Bank of Jamaica uh, when I went there a couple of years ago uh, because I wanted to own the banknotes that really started me on this journey. Um, and so you can imagine an uh, a eight, nine year old kid, you just found a, a, a wallet full of cash and you're so happy about it. Um, I ran to the first adult that I saw and I think you you can probably guess uh, guess the, the the rest of the story. I never saw that wallet again. Um, I was uh, so the the the, the uh, adult you know um, took it away from me. Um, I don't don't know what what eventually happened to it. But when uh, you know like 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 many people uh, when when my family migrated to uh, the United States, particularly to the Bronx, I. I I was fortunate that I moved into a neighborhood. Um, it's it's called Parkchester uh, in the Bronx, where um, every Saturday we had a, a market, a street market where um, different uh, numismatists came out and sold banknotes. And so I happened to be passing by one day and I saw this guy with a with a table full of all these banknotes. Um, uh, and some coins, but mainly banknotes from all over the world. Um, and I was looking for the ones that I had uh, found in Jamaica and he didn't have them. Um, but uh, I was curious uh, about the, uh, the other currencies from all over the world. And so I started collecting these banknotes. Um, you know, whatever little money I worked, uh, I would, as soon as I got paid on a Friday, uh, you know, I, I couldn't wait until Saturday morning to go out there and spend all my money on these banknotes um, from all over the world. And so uh, my collection of banknotes started there. Um, I think at some point uh, I, I, I developed a particular interest in banknotes from Latin America, uh, but nonetheless, I, I collected from all over. 
and of course, back then, um, and this is in the early 90s, we didn't have the internet as it, as, as it is now. And so I did a lot of research going to the, the public library, looking up some of the individuals, some of the, 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 the stories, uh, the historical sites that I had seen on these banknotes. And I started essentially writing uh, a book about some of the patterns that I saw and things of that nature. Um, um, in addition to that, I, I started presenting information about uh, these uh, banknotes at local libraries. Uh, when I started college, I, you know, I, I got, um, I used to give talks um, on uh, certain individuals on, on banknotes um, and things of that nature. Um, and sort of to fast forward, um, I went to um, the UK and, and did my PhD at the London School of Economics. And I, I did my PhD in the uh, International History Department. Um, and my research was centered on uh, the connections between, um, well, my initial research was, was centered on the connections between money and colonialism uh, in British West Africa. And my case study was to look at the Gold Coast, which, uh, which is also, or which became Ghana. Um, and then uh, eventually when I did my, uh, when I worked on my dissertation, I, I, I looked at um, how Ghana's first uh, president, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah used money as a way of expressing uh, national identity and to build a new nation state, which I'll talk about later in the talk. During my time in the UK, I was also a, um, a research assistant in the coins and metals department at the British Museum, uh, where uh, among many other things, uh, we worked on the Money in Africa project, uh, which led to the publication of this book uh, on my left. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a member of uh, the uh, International Banknote Society, in addition to other uh, numismatic organizations. So what really, I would say, what really uh, led me to create uh, what is now called the, the Black Money Exhibit uh, is the issue of uh, the Tubman 20. Um, because I can remember uh, back in, I would say, you know, 2015 or so, 2015, 2016, you know, I can remember when the debates were happening about uh, changing uh, U.S. currency, um, having more representation of, um, you know, uh, you know, um, Hispanics, uh, African Americans, women, et cetera, Native Americans on, on banknotes to, to reflect the makeup of the country. And during all these debates, uh, you know, I said, you know, there are women on currencies in many other countries. And so uh, what the first thing I did was I said, I, 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 let me, let me uh, put some of my research out there. And so I authored this article, which is on my left, which is, which is called, uh, Who Was the First Woman Dep Depicted on American Currency? Uh, and what I did with that article, uh, and by the way, this was published in, the, in uh, the conversation and then carried by a variety of other sources. Um, what I did in that article was that I, I, I tried to survey American history and look at uh, uh, paper currency, um, including the currencies issued by the uh, Confederate States of America, and came up with an idea as to who was most likely the first real and not allegorical woman depicted on American bank, uh, American bank notes, uh, and I'm talking in the continental United States. Um, and within the context of that article, I also uh, spoke about uh, the Harriet Tubman um, 20. So that's what really got me started. And then I went on to saying that I wanted to organize an exhibition, uh, a traveling exhibition of my banknotes to basically tell a narrative about um, 
uh, the depiction of Africans, African Americans, people of African descent, Black people on, on banknotes, um, which led me to creating the Black Money exhibit. Um, and the Black Money exhibit was uh, first uh, exhibited at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American culture and history in, in Atlanta. And so uh, I, I want to just talk about a couple of things that I that I did with the with the um, with the exhibition. The first thing was that we we came up with the with the with the concept of d displaying these banknotes on uh, what we call money trees. And as you can see uh, with these photographs in the background, these are eight eight foot high by eight foot um, wide trees that were inspired by the Baobab tree, uh, otherwise known as the tree of life uh, uh, in, 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 in many parts of Africa. And we were playing with the idea of, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, but for the black money exhibit, money does grow on trees, right? Um, so that was the first uh, idea that we came, came up with. And so the next step was, well, what categories should I be representing with respect to the themes that we want to um, bring to the public? Um, and there are so many themes. I, I in my own research, um, and, and by the way, th th this, this is not specific to money depicting people of African descent. This, this is money, uh, uh, paper money in general. I identified over 40 different themes that one could possibly talk about. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 I whittled it down to about to, to the, these 10 themes. And the idea was that, you know, when uh, as, as a professor of, of history and particularly African American, African Black history, whichever term you want to use, usually we go through these, um, these, these themes. Um, uh, and topics uh, such as, you know, we begin with African civilizations by talking about some of the major civilizations um, on, on the continent of Africa, in all parts of Africa. Uh, and then we go through the development of African art um, and things of that nature. Um, and then some of the other major um, episodes, if you will, in, in, in in, uh, in African, African-American Black history, such as the transatlantic slave trade and resistance against slavery, colonialism, independence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the 10 themes that you see there, uh, the way how we represent that is we have 10 different money trees and I have selected uh, banknotes that are then um, displayed to, to, dis to discuss these themes. Uh, uh, and during the inaugur inaugural showing of the Black Money exhibit, it was very well received. Uh, I think, uh, you know, most people said that they, they had no idea that you had so many depictions of women and uh, people of African descent on, on banknotes. And again, it tied into the notion of, well, what about us in this country and how are we going to represent the, the, what the country actually looks like on our banknotes. Uh, so that was one of the main takeaways. And these are some of the pictures that I have there. Um, and so what I also do with the Black Money exhibit uh, is we, we discuss the notion of, well, what is money? Um, and you know, the, these are just the academic terms that, you know, um, we all know what money is, uh, but what we try to do with the Black Money Exhibit, in addition to having discussions in the galleries about uh, what is money, we talk specifically about, well, let's take a look at Africa um, and, and look at some of the, 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 the forms of monies that were used before the introduction of, of modern, uh, currencies, i.e. banknotes and coins. Uh, and so when one goes into the Black Money exhibit, we have an exhibition 
uh, with uh, uh, with examples of some of these forms of currencies, uh, cowrie shells, for example, or uh, you know met met metallic currencies like uh, Katanga crosses or Manilas, um, uh, and things of that nature. Um, so we we try to uh, we try to um, you know, have the public think about how Africans used uh, currency and what 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 did that currency look like before uh, the you know before the colonial era. Now, of course, you know these um, um, these these um, currencies are not unique to Africa in this sense. Of course, you know Native Americans and 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 certainly people all over the world before the advent of uh, modern banknotes and coins have used a variety of different kinds of um, commodity uh, currencies. Um, so going with, uh, with that um, part of the exhibition, what we then try to do is say, well, let's look at some examples of how uh, Africa or in Africa, how you know, they use this money uh, to express wealth and power. Uh, and by the way, just let me say that, um, uh, so why am I talking about Africa? Well, of course, um, you know, African-American history or African diasporic history, of course, did not begin in the United States, right? Uh, or in, you know, the, the Americas, right? So in the academic profession, we, again, we go back to, uh, I guess the roots, if you will, and 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 talk about those connections, uh, historical connections, cultural connections, etc. Uh, and so, what we do in the exhibition is we try to find examples of uh, real individuals um, uh, that 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 demonstrate the use of these types of currency. So, on my left uh, is Emperor. Emperor Mansa Musa, who was the emperor of Mali in the 14th century. And he has been in, the, in recent years, been um, recognized as the wealthiest human being that has ever lived. Now, um, you know, there are others who would put him at number two or number three, but certainly in many sources, um, they, they estimate that the wealth that he had, if you, if you calculated it in today's wealth, he would have at least four hundred billion dollars, um, because he, of course, controlled uh, the gold um, routes um, in 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 West and, and North Africa, which also fed into into the European gold market as well. Um, and then on my right is one of the former kings of the. Asante or the Ashanti uh, Empire in West Africa, mainly concentrated in, in Ghana and uh, the Cote d'Ivoire. And it shows um, how, of course, he's adorned with, with gold, which is a sign of his wealth and power and status as well. Um, of course, uh, with the exhibition, we go into a lot more details with historical documents, historical photographs, video footage, speakers to sort of um, add more content to, 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 to this. Um, so let me move away from um, uh, sort of pre-colonial Africa and, uh, you know, money and power and status, wealth, and then go into the colonial era, which of course, um, you know, after the transatlantic slave trade ended in the 19th century, by the time we get to um, the late you know, um, 1880s, 1884, 1885, uh, there is a uh, so-called scramble for Africa in which uh, the major European powers divided Africa um, among themselves. Um, and then subsequently, one of the um, important things that they did in order to, to consolidate their holdings is to issue coins at first, and then of course later banknotes. Um, and so we have examples of these banknotes in uh, the exhibition, and what we try to do is to highlight certain things. For example, uh, this, th this, um, this, this, this 
essentially French issued banknote shows uh, the participation of African soldiers in the, uh, in, in, in the Second World War. Um, and then this banknote is um, issued uh, by you know, the Belgian colonial state uh, in its colonies of Rwanda, et cetera. It also shows uh, soldiers, uh, African soldiers on parade serving in the colonial army. Uh, now, this is important um, on a, a number of levels. Um, you know, sometimes one has to state what might be obvious to some, but not others, that um, Africans also participated in the world wars. Um, they paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, as well. Uh, and then we can also compare that to, let's say, you know, African Americans who also served in both world wars. Uh, how did they participate? How were they treated when they returned home? Um, you know, uh, how did their participation change their status in their uh, respective society? So, so we can have conversations around, uh, you know, comparing, uh, you know, blacks or you know people of African descent in the Caribbean, in the United States, Canada, you know, as well as in Europe and Africa in terms of uh, their relationship to, the, to these uh, or their participation in, the, in these wars. Um, so we, we move from colonial, colonialism and its connection to currencies and how that, is, how that was represented during the uh, colonial era, which of course the colonial era begins to end after the Second World War, excuse me, when there is a rise in um, nationalism um, in, in, well, of course, in, in, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and of course, in Asia. Uh, and, and so with the birth of independent states uh, in uh, the 1950s, 1960s, and beyond, again, the first thing that, um, Africans and you know uh, Caribbean governments do is that they they issue their own currencies, uh, showing their own um, uh, heroes and sheroes and things of that nature. Uh, just one note about this this coin here. Um, uh, you know this is a, a coin from Ethiopia, which shows uh, Emperor Menelik II uh, uh, from the 19th century. So this coin does not relate to the um, post-colonial period uh, in Africa. I put it here just to show, for example, that Ethiopia was one of two African countries that was never colonized during the 19th century scramble for Africa. And that on their currency, they, they put their own leaders uh, as every state does. Um, but what you can find here just like with our currency in the United States, are those people who the nation state deems to be their founding fathers. Uh, and of course, usually in, 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 in many countries, they're usually founding fathers and women are not depicted as much as, as men. So that's why I have examples here only of men, but I will get to the depiction of women um, uh, later on as well. Uh, and by the way, um, if, if the moderators could also if I'm going over time, uh, just please let me know. I can, I can stop at any time. Um, what you find here are examples of currencies uh, from all over Africa, uh, as well as the Caribbean that shows heroes, you know, to them and presidents, you know, uh, this is Marcus Garvey in Jamaica. And this is one of the banknotes that I had found uh, in, in that wallet that I spoke about. Um, you know, um, Jomo Kenyatta from Kenya, uh, you know, a variety of, of Julius Nirere from Tanzania, et cetera. And of course, um, I, I included Nelson Mandela, of course, um, you know, South Africa was an independent country, uh, w w of course, when Mandela became president, but one could argue that uh, South Africa became truly independent when they had a uh, universal franchise and when black South Africans were 
uh, able to participate fully in the democracy. Um, let me uh, just talk a little bit about um, one area which uh, which I which I have studied a lot, and this is the example of uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah um, in the Gold Coast, which was renamed Ghana. And so, on your left here, uh, these are examples of of coins that the British issued in, in for its West African um, colonies, which included uh, what is now Ghana, Nigeria. Um, you know, Sierra, Sierra Leone, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have examples of the British monarchs being depicted on colonial coinage that were issued for circulation in West Africa. And this one on the bottom is an example of a British, a British banknote that was issued for Britain's East African colonies, of course, showing uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, in 1957, when Ghana became the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to, to gain its independence from a European power, uh, its first prime minister and first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, issued uh, his own currencies. Um, uh, and so this, for ex this, this currency here, which was issued in 1958, which is one year after independence, uh, has the, the Latin phrase uh, civitatis ganiensis conditor, which means uh, founder of the state of Ghana. Um, in 1960, when Ghana became a republic, uh, Nkrumah issued gold coins to commemorate the, uh, the event. And um, later on, uh, he also issued uh, uh, banknotes with his image. Uh, now, this is an interesting episode in, in history because at the time that Ghana became independent, it was still, its status was a dominion within the British Commonwealth. And as such, the protocol was to keep the British monarchs, which at the time was Queen Elizabeth, to keep her head or, or her bust on the currency. Uh, now, when Nkrumah to uh, change the coinage and put his image on there, and uh, and again, this he was the you know the living president, right? We, right um, at the time, this caused a big a sort of diplomatic spat between uh, Britain and Ghana because the British authorities, through the Bank of England and the uh, Colonial Office, etc., um, um, complained that Nkrumah was breaking with protocol by removing the queen's image from the coinage. Uh, whereas Nkrumah argued that uh, many Ghanaians could not, uh, were not literate and that the only way to convince them that they were um, uh, uh, independent was uh, to, that they would, they had to see a, a fellow African on the coinage, um, and and that's 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 you know that's how that went. And then once Ghana became a republic, then um, you know uh, that issue was 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 laid to rest. But I point that out just to show you that currencies, money can also be a source of, of course, showing who is in charge, but it can also be used to express a national identity to express independence um, and things of that nature. Um, so uh, let me switch from that and just briefly talk about uh, a, uh, another uh, Black women on money. Um, and uh, you know, I'm working on a documentary called Black Women on Money. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, 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 in a second, but I'll, I'll just go through these slides very quickly. Um, of course, even though men dominate the imagery, the iconography of money globally, as well as in, in Africa and the Caribbean and in the United States, there are many examples of women on money. Um, uh, and in this, in this case, in the Black Money exhibit, we find examples of Black women on currencies, uh, whether real or uh, allegorical, and we construct a narrative around them using historical documents and things of that nature. 
Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, this, this, this bank note, which is from Guinea-Bissau, is an interesting bank note, which we have in the exhibition, uh, because it's the only bank note from Africa that I can find that, that, that tackles the issue of slavery head on. So you see that this bank note here uh, depicts a, a, the a capture of Africans uh, including women. Um, and then you see the, they're being marched to the coast and then being put on boats, which will then ferry them to the ships, which will take them to the America. So a banknote like this is, 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 is a means that we use to, to connect African, African, European, and American history. And certainly within that African American and also Caribbean uh, and Latin American history, because the connection is, in this case, through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, this banknote uh, from Jamaica is a $500 bill. Um, I, I have done a documentary about the historical uh, early 18th century figure depicted on, on, on this banknote called um, her name is Queen Nanny. She was captured in West Africa um, and brought to Jamaica as an enslaved woman. And then she rose up to uh, challenge the British militarily uh, and actually defeat British forces um, in uh, Jamaica. So I, I have um, done a documentary about her and I'm working on some other projects, including a, a movie uh, about, about her, her history as well. Um, I will just, in the interest of time, I think I'll go through to my last section here. Um, and I, I want to talk about the, um, just some of the recent developments in terms of what I would call the um, representing different narratives on, on banknotes. Um, and having more inclusion on banknotes in countries that don't normally uh, essentially have this, this, this practice, if you will. Um, so this is a banknote from Canada, uh, which depicts um, uh, Viola Desmond, who um, is often described as the Rosa Parks of Canada uh, in, in the 1940s after the Second World War she was going to a movie theater in Halifax and uh, she was she sat in a section that was informally considered to be a white only section uh, she sat there and ultimately was arrested um, and her court case sort of sparked the modern uh, racial equality or civil rights movement in Canada um, and uh, in 2018 uh, she was placed on this this ten dollar uh, Canadian banknote, which, by the way, won the IBNS's a uh, banknote of the year um, award, um, and so we we were fortunate enough to, when the Black Money exhibit was launched in 2018, we were fortunate enough to have this banknote in the collection. Uh, this is an image of Viola Desmond's living sister who was holding up the banknote. Um, and um, this uh, is the former uh, Canadian Consul General uh, to Atlanta, uh, Nadia Theodore, who co-sponsored the Black Money exhibit and provided us with, with resources to construct and present a narrative about, um, uh, you know, uh, Viola Desmond here. So um, I will end just by uh, talking uh, briefly about the representation of African Americans on banknotes. Uh, of course, the only representation we we have, uh, well, uh, one 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 of the few representations, are the the banknotes from the uh, Southern states in the 1850s, and then of course the con Confederacy in the 1860s. Um, where you can see, uh, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, you know, vignettes including uh, slave mother and child right here, uh, slaves hoeing cotton, uh, slave master overseeing his slaves, 
um, uh, slave roasting potatoes for Confederate generals, right? So what we do with this is we, 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 we have a selection of these banknotes to show that African-Americans have been depicted on banknotes, except that not on the banknotes of the United States of America, but the Confederate States of America. But the depiction was, um, of course, them as, as, as slaves. And of course, the importance of that is, you know, there is this uh, debate, if you will, about whether or not slavery was the, the main cause of the uh, Civil War. Uh, certainly, my, um, that's the view that I take. I, and I think I, you know, the evidence at least can be seen from these historical uh, documents, uh, which, which, I would, which I would call them as well. Um, uh, this is sort of an anecdote. Uh, uh, Joseph Jenkins Roberts uh, was an African-American man who became the first and the seventh president of Liberia. So I often tell folks that the first African-American president, president was actually Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who happened to have been president of, of Liberia. So again, we, we try to find these banknotes that tell a story and that connect to African-American history or you know Black history. African diasporic history, et cetera. Um, the only other time, uh, and this is kind of meant to be tongue, tongue in cheek in a, in a sense, if you've ever watched the movie Coming to America, the, uh, where uh, um, Eddie Murphy is depicted as Prince um, Akeem, uh, this is the uh, banknote that uh, he was depicted on. And so, you know, I think when we discuss these things at the Black Money Exhibit, you know, people say, uh, you know, it is about time for American currencies to reflect the makeup of the country, whether it's through a figure like Harriet Tubman or other figures, uh, but that it actually is something that strengthens the union and not weakens it. You know, diversity is always a plus. Um, and I think with that, I will, I will end with this slide. Um, this is a slide of the uh, Black Money exhibit and specifically the documentary that we're doing, which will feature these five women uh, that have already been depicted on banknotes, but the documentary will also include a discussion about uh, the continuing uh, movement, if you will, to get Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. So at this point, I will stop sharing. And um, again, sincerely thank all of you for your time um, and uh, attention. And um, I'd be happy to have a discussion and take questions. Thank you. Well, I have a question if, um, well, other people think about it. Um, I know the Black Money Exhibit has that great website, but is it on view anywhere? Can we go see it in person at this point? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, it actually exists in my basement. So if you go through that door, <laughs> you open that door, you make a right, it's, it's stored in my basement for a variety of reasons. You know, these things uh, to mount an exhibition takes a, a lot of cash. I, and so over the past two years, we've been, uh, we have been redesigning the exhibition for travel. We have been doing the research to, to, to contextualize the bank notes. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this thing called COVID hits, uh, hit and you know. So um, we were fortunate to, to, to just have received a uh, $50,000 grant from the um, Whiting uh, Foundation. And we're using uh, that, those funds in addition to a, a, a Newman uh, Fellowship uh, for 5,000 that we're going to be using uh, to construct the physical exhibition um, so that it can then travel across the country, uh, hopefully ne uh, early next year. So that's the goal. And we continue to fundraise for the exhibition to, to get it out there. Cool. Congrats on that loan. That's great. Um, anyone have questions? Uh, I have a question. Um, 
So I'm personally really fascinated with, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, non-traditional forms of money. Uh, so Kuba cloths, you know, the, the Katanga crosses you mentioned, manila bracelets, et cetera. It, the term that's sort of used or has been used for a long time is, you know, odd and curious money or non-traditional money, which, you know, sort of in a worst case scenario is pejorative, but even in a best case scenario, sort of puts that kind of the money uh, on a sort of second tier compared to sort of, you know, traditional uh, round money and paper money. Have you considered all sort of a, a term, a sort of better all encompassing term for that kind of money that's not, uh, you know, sort of pejorative like odd and curious? Yeah, I mean, uh, and thanks for that question. Um, I, I don't personally use odd and curious. Um, and, you know, as with any terminology, uh, I think one can always make an argument for or against it. But certainly uh, the notion of um, traditional currencies uh, being used, if we're talking, let's say, about in Africa or even with Native Americans, you know, tradition and traditional, of course, has certain connotations, right, which can be cultural inferiority or, you know, their system is not as sophisticated as those countries that produce modern banknotes and coins. And certainly looking at the historical um, record, uh, one would find that this is how uh, African systems of wealth African systems of, um, um, you know, um, commerce have, to, quite frankly, too often been described as primitive or not, you know, up to par because they've used traditional forms of currencies. Um, but then, the narrative or or the the mainstream narrative would go that with the introduction of colonial currencies, um, then. Africans were sort of brought up to speed. But of course, the introduction of colonial currencies also meant that Afri the ways in which Africans stored their wealth was demonetized and that made many people poorer. Um, we can use the case of cowrie shells, for example. When uh, cowrie shells were demonetized, if you were, if you had your wealth with, you had all this cowrie shells and you can buy whatever and you had a certain status. And then the colonial government says, that is either no longer money or you, you have to exchange your cowrie shells for, uh, um, for our currencies, but we're going to devalue what, what it's worth. You can see how you have a loss of, um, of wealth and status and all these kinds of things. Um, but I use the term traditional currencies, I, I guess, to, to distinguish it from what came after. But, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want, this is not exactly a question, but I'm so looking forward to see how all of the areas of specialization develop with regard to money during the Civil War, money before the Civil War, informal money that slaves may have used during the Civil War, uh, a, a, as well as the African countries. There are so many things to study. Uh, it, it's, it's really a very exciting field. Uh, yes, it, uh, and I, I, I've been very uh, fortunate, very blessed to, to have uh, been, been doing this. For me, it's really the, the questions and the reactions, you know, when people visit the website or if I give a talk or when they see the exhibition, because there's just so much information out there and so much knowledge and so, so many ways in which currencies actually connect us. Uh, one of the things I try to do with the Black Money exhibit, again, is to find examples of maybe a currency that connects let's say the history of, of Haiti, um, uh, which uh, as a side note, uh, suffered a uh, devastating earthquake uh, today, in addition to other Caribbean islands. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, a, a, a Haitian uh, soldier who fought in the war of 1812, defending 
uh, the United States, there are all of these connections or, or, you know, that we can find to bring, to bring all these seemingly disparate uh, histories together. I, I also just want to say that as you were talking, I had great flashbacks to my dad giving similar talks in the 1950s. Okay, cool. Except all the black people were Jewish. <laughs> And it was the Jewish people on the coins and the Jewish people who were pictured on the stamps and who were pictured on the money. Wow. And it's very interesting to see the parallels. Thank you very much. What happened to that research? Did you ever publish that? Um, uh, no, but it's, it's around, you know, I mean, other people have worked on it. Mm -hmm. My dad was a, really a hobbyist, but there are, there are, there are a lot of things. I, well, you and I will be in touch. All right, thanks. Thanks. I, I'd like to um, ask a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, okay. Never know whether this thing works here. Yeah. Um, coming back a little bit to the question with John about that, <clears throat> you know, the different forms of money we have in particular in Africa and the cowrie shells are sort of interesting. You have this in China as well, right? You have cowrie shells and then there is this development. And Considering how incredibly wealthy Africa is, and here I'm looking in particular at my own area, antiquity, um, where there's a lot of research now in place, how there's African money, where the only places where you have coinage is, and quite early on, is a sort of, you know, the northern coast, effectively. And, and one of the really fascinating questions is um, why it never sort of spreads you know, um, when there is all this wealth, or perhaps it is exactly that wealth and, and these other forms, which are so incredibly powerful. I mean, I mean and, and you can go on, you know, when you gave this, this, I think quite probably correct, you know, the richest man, we always think, yeah, Croesus, no, it, you know, it's probably something rather different. Um, do you have a, do you have an explanation for this phenomenon? How late, let's say the coinage that we have in so many other places, why it's so late? And when you say late, uh, are you saying why was it still in use even in the 20th century? I'm, I'm trying to figure. No, I'm, I'm almost thinking, you know, why it only comes really um, with, with as a colonial phenomenon, you know, when everywhere oh, else right. there's like this sort of spread, yes. you know, you, you, you have, in fact, you have the Chinese tradition sort of mm -hmm. almost coming at the same time as the Western tradition. And, um, you know, so you have coinage as something, but Africa is the sort of uh, um, exception um, with, with Egypt where you, you have it and why that is. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I think, I guess I, it, to answer that question, I think we have to go back to a, uh, a fundamental issue with which some people might find controversial. Um, uh, certainly I don't, but um, um, Egypt and North Africa are Africa, African countries. So they are, because they are a part of Africa. Uh, so what I'm saying is that, you know, in academia, for example, the, the distinction is often made between North Africa as you know belonging to sort of the Western tradition, and uh, and the Islamic world, and then Sub-Saharan Africa is quote unquote Black Africa. Um, mm -hmm. And while, of course, that is a part of it to some extent, I think we, uh, I think, at least, I, 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 I mean, the, the term we can have a whole discussion about. Black and that sort of thing. But what I'm saying is that Africa is more diverse, right? Um, North Africa was never uh, cut off from the rest of Africa, even, you know, uh, with the uh, Sahara Desert, right? So if you're looking at the Trans-Saharan trade, uh, where you have in the case, let's take the case of Mansa Musa, you have trade goods, agricultural products, a gold, um, and other commodities going from uh, the uh, tropical areas of Africa, traveling to North Africa through the camel trade. And then from Europe and North Africa, you have 
uh, silks and perfumes and, and you know, books and salt coming south. So what I'm saying is that, um, that North Africa is Africa and it is a part of Africa. Um, and that Africa is, is beyond just, uh, let's say black, it is diverse. Uh, and we can appreciate that, you know, being in the United States where this country is defined by its, at least to, to many by its diversity. Uh, and so in that sense, I would say that coinage didn't really come late to Africa. Yes, one can say coinage came late to, if we want to look at it in regional terms, to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but, but it did come to, it was, you know, North Africa was a part of that. Um, I guess the second thing I would say is that, um, uh, that uh, again, whether, it's a, whether people are using coins, cowrie shells, katanga crosses, or, or gold nuggets, or gold dust, uh, money is money, is money um, however you, you use it. So I think that's probably how I would also look at that as well. I, if, I, if I may, I know someone, uh, George uh, Kuhaj said that the Newark Museum in New Jersey had an exhibit space dedicated to blacks on coins and paper money. Um, and I would love to get more information about that, perhaps if there has been an article written about it, excuse me, or, uh, or a link um, so that I can um, add that to my research and, and yeah. And so thanks for that, George. I have a question about that documentary you're working on. Is that um, going to be more telling the stories of the women that they chose to put on the banknotes or is it more um, the journey it took to get them on the banknotes? What's the spin? Is it feature length? I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, the documentary, which is tentatively called Black Women on Money, what we were, and again, uh, the sort of, the reason why we also chose to do this is to highlight these women and their journey to the banknote and who they are. But again, in the context of this uh, discussion about Tubman on the 20, we want to explore, explore that. Well, how does one get on a banknote, um, right? So, um, and all these women, of course, uh, they have one thing in common, which is these are women who have, uh, overcame adversity as well. Um, Queen Nanny uh, in Jamaica, again, who was uh, an enslaved woman. Um, she confronted the most powerful military might on the planet at the time, arguably, which was Great Britain, um, and fought them for several decades and forced them to sign a peace treaty in 1739. Um, I think that's a very compelling story, uh, as compelling as, as that of Tubman's. Uh, or again, if we go to Ghana, uh, a, a, a queen mother, Nana Ya Asantewa, when the British has um, defeated the people of what is now Ghana, they were confronted with uh, the kingdom, this sort of ancient kingdom that was a part of this territory and they wanted to incorporate the Ashantis into this British colony called the Gold Coast. And this woman stood up to them, confronted them militarily with uh, 20,000 uh, warriors, held them off for about you know, eight months, even though she was ultimately defeated. But again, this, this shows the bravery of these women uh, and then how once their countries became independent, and they were looking for heroes and sheroes to commemorate, you know, as we do in this country. They found these figures who were ordinary individuals who, who rose to uh, extra, extraordinary heights. So that's kind of the story that we want to tell with, with some of these, um, these women. Looking forward to that. Um, I have a question from the chat. Is the ancient coinage of Axiom part of your study and exhibit? Uh, so um, I, um, I guess 
the answer is no. I, I chose to focus on on bank notes uh, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, um, we chose that we were going to. You know, you can show more on a bank note. Yet it's more colorful. It's larger than coins, and so we just decided to to focus the black money exhibit only on on uh, on bank notes. However. Throughout the course of my research, I have had to uh, use coins, and I showed you some examples of some coins that I've had to use. Um, and I, I also collect coins. I happen to have a particular interest in coins from Africa, particularly those showing certain historical individuals or certain historical narratives. So I collect coins, I do research on coins, I write about coins, but for the Black Money exhibit, it's, it, these are bank notes. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have some questions? Um, so I do, um, Dr. Fuller, can you tell me what cities you hope the traveling exhibition will visit? Well, I, I hate to be biased, but, you know, I would love to see it in New York City, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's one of, again, it's one yeah. of my homes, and um, I would love to bring it to New York City, um, and by the way, before I go on, I, I also neglected to say that, you know, one of the ways in which, again, it, we, we're trying to get more, uh, for lack of a better term, non-traditional collectors to get into the hobby. There is value in money and not just, of course, for what it's physically worth, but the history. And that's what I'm trying to. So one of the ways that we're trying to get more people involved is uh, we also have a soundtrack, um, an actual real soundtrack with music uh, that goes with the exhibition. Um, so we've already started recording songs and we have songs from over 12 different countries in different genres and different languages. Um, if you go to blackmoneyexhibit.com and you click on uh, soundtrack, you'll see some of those uh, songs and we've, be we've began to do music videos as well. Um, so, you know, sh sh I mean, all over the country uh, and also internationally, just because it's, this, is, this is an international exhibition, but, you know, we wanna start from home first. And um, I would just say, you know, we're, whoever has an interest to bring it to their city once once uh, it's ready to tour physically, uh, we would love to do that. Uh, we're also working on a, a virtual exhibition so that audiences can um, see the exhibition until they can see the full exhibition physically at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're one minute from the hour. If anyone has any last questions. Oh, you're getting a round of applause, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, by the way, it's very hard as a historian to be, uh, I'm usually long winded. So I was saying I, I gotta, I gotta, you know, gotta do this in a half an hour or, or 35 minutes. So, um, uh, but I'm, I'm really enjoying this, you know. I enjoyed I'm, this too. Emma, if I may, um, because, Jahari Knowles is on this talk and she's far too shy um, to say anything, but she's just finished a major research project on a group of medals um, that uh, depicts only African-American um, men and women um, that were issued in the 19, late 60s and 70s. Yes. And there's gonna be a wonderful article about this. This is this um, issued by something called the um, American Negro Commemorative Society, Jaharia. Do you want to say something, or are you? Because oh, it's, yeah. really, it's oh. such a great article, and and um, I hope everyone reads it. But maybe you want to say just something. It's so relevant to the topic. Oh that, yeah. Um. Well, I guess it's. I guess it's. I mean, not as expansive. I guess timeline wise as your project. Um. But no, it's really interesting. Of course, it's not. It's not based on money it's just commemorative medals but I don't know I think the range and subjects even they're not all American there is Marcus Garvey and I believe there's 
another person on there who's not from America, but the, the subjects range, I don't know, all different types of historical periods, backgrounds, careers, and it's, I don't know, it's really interesting to see just how deep the history goes. I don't even, I'm not articulating this well, sorry. <laughs> um, no, but it's a, it's a really interesting article. I'll, I'll email you later, Mr. Fuller, <laughs> because Great. I think I'll, I'll put my thoughts better together than now. <laughs> well, no, that's really wonderful. And um, uh, first of all, I'm very happy that uh, a young person is, is involved, you know, uh, we need to continue to work hard to get young people involved in, in our great um, hobby. Um, are we still calling, is it a hobby? I, I, cause I, for me, it's a profession now. I, so I, is that, is it, is it still a hobby or what are we calling it now? Um, Depends what angle you come from, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be both. For yeah. some of us, it's a hobby and a profession yeah. <laughs> like you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let me say if I just in closing, um, again, I think um, that, you know, inclusion, again, is always great. It's great to see uh, other people looking at uh, different people that have been depicted, whether on, on coins, banknotes, uh, medals, because we all grow from it. We all learn more. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to, 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 you know, be in the company of, of doing that. I guess my final thing is a question uh, for Don Squires. Uh, you know, I have to ask you what coin that is and if, um, uh, if you could tell us something about that because um, I'm, I'm very curious. That is a um, Byzantine gold coin called a, a solidus or a nomisma in Greek. And it's of the uh, Emperor Constantine the Seventh when he was the sole emperor um, in the uh, uh, 10th century. Um, he was a, a, a learned man and an historian. Um, and that's just, a, I, I collect Byzantine coins. That's really, really great. Um, I'm so happy. Uh, and who, who, who can't love this hobby? I mean, it's just, is there's so much information in, in, uh, in, on these small pieces of metal or paper. Um, but again, I, I, really, I, I really enjoy this uh, and I wanna thank the ANS uh, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to be with you on this Saturday. Thank you for giving us your Saturday. Thanks again. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You. All right, thanks. And if anyone wants to get I'm in gonna... touch, um, you know, um, I think my email is there and uh, I'd be happy to continue this. And next time I'm in New York, hopefully, you know, we're over COVID and I can come visit. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication and events, you can support the society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.